Hey, welcome, welcome. This is going to be good stuff today. I'm uh, going to go over a ton of uh, really, really basic culinary knowledge today. We're going to go over knives. We're, we're calling this one Blades of Glory, okay? My name's Dave Nelson, if you don't already know, and this is Quarantine Kitchen Happy Hour. That means it's Monday at 4 o'clock, and every Monday at 4, I'm right here with you doing my thing in my little kitchen, uh, uh, teaching culinary arts, uh, just general knowledge. What I think is is kitchen survival skills, really, you know? Uh, uh, and so um, here I am doing it. Uh, the, the impetus for this show, if you will, was a very, very good longtime family friend of mine, Amber, who is in our uh, uh, industry cooking classes group on the side there. Um, she posted a little something asking about knives, serrated knives specifically. So uh, there was a little discussion in the thread and I decided to just go ahead and do my standard knife class because, hey, this is, this is kind of one of the things that I have to talk about with culinary students. You need to know about knives and how to sharpen them, how to keep them sharp, how to maintain, you know, what kind of knife you need for what job and all of that. So I'll go through all of that stuff. Um, and I also wanted to go over some basic knife cuts just to get them all in one place, okay? So that's what today's going to be all about. Looks like some more people are showing up. I got Michelle out there, Rick, Brittany. Hey, thanks for showing up, guys. It's awesome. Thanks for joining me. It really uh, uh, makes me feel good to know that there are still people out there. Who knows, you know, what's going on out there? I'm one of those people that's been kind of stuck inside for most of this. And uh, uh, I really appreciate hanging out with you guys uh, every week and not just once a week, yeah. but every Thursday. I'm doing between the two stoves and I am doing it this week with Bill No. Most of you know that crew, Sacramento favorite. Uh, they had an employee that had coronavirus and so they had to shut down, they had to disinfect, they had to reopen and go through all of that. And I really, really wanted to talk to him about what that experience was like. And Thursday, okay, this Thursday at five on between two stoves, okay? Again, Bill No from Crew. Uh, I think it's something that anybody that is into the industry and working in the industry, you should hear this stuff, okay? So um, uh, please, please check that out on Thursday, okay? Let's see, I got Mags out there. Good to show up. Good, good of you to show up, everyone. Uh, I, and so, hey, let's just go over kind of what I want to talk about today, okay? Uh, just broad overview from outer space. We are looking at a knife work overview is what I call this, right? Uh, I'm going to go over different types of knives, okay? Specifically, you go to the store, what to look for. Uh, uh, and it's it's we're also going to look at different types of knives for different jobs, okay? Um, we're going to look at the parts of a knife, right? We're going to look at... Uh, keeping the edge on a knife, maintaining it. As I said earlier, we're gonna look at how to hold it, how to stand basically, um, some safety tips, right? We're gonna go over all of that. And then once we kind of do all of that, get your grip right, because like like everything in, in sports and in life, it's all in the grip, they say, okay? So um, once we get all that done, we will start looking at some very basic kitchen work, some knife cuts, you know, just, Again, the, the basic survival skills that I, you know, I bet a lot of people know, but it's, it's good to kind of have reviews of this stuff, right? Um, the more you know, the more you can show to someone else. And, and that's really the ultimate gift of, of what I do is when I see other people passing that knowledge along, it uh, uh, kind of makes me feel good, okay? And so um, uh, uh, please join along as I go over this stuff. Uh, full disclosure, I have a loaf of bread in the oven. You guys, if you've ever made uh, your own bread, uh, you know you're kind of a slave to the ingredients there. I have to kind of go when it, when it, when it needs to go in the oven, right? And so it's cruising in there. We're going to hear a little timer here. I'll check it. We'll get it going again. And uh, uh, and we'll just keep right on going with this show, okay? Uh, if anybody has any questions, please add them into the uh, chat thread over there. If you don't uh, get an answer during the show, we'll round them up at the end and I'll see if I can kind of answer all your questions out there, okay? Looks like a bunch of people are cruising by. I got old Nate out there. Hey, good to see you, brother. One of my old students out there. Always good to see that stuff. Heidi's out there looking good. Michael, uh, hey, I really, again, appreciate you guys. Hey, it's quarantine kitchen happy hour. And I think while we're at it, we should probably uh, uh, have, I should probably toast all of you with water. Good old Sacramento fresh. Okay. But uh, toast to all of you guys that, uh, Keep it all happening every week with me, okay? Uh, uh, being interested in this. Tell your friends, guys. Get people to watch those videos. I, I really, you know, it, I'm kind of a funky guy, you know. I know this is all kind of disjointed, uh, uh, what Sacramento Magazine called basically stream of consciousness here. But, um, hey, 
there's real technique in here. You go into my videos and there's little nuggets of gold in there just based on years and years of experience. I should say I'm not, you know, some Joe super chef that everybody's heard of. Nobody ever heard about me uh, before I started doing these classes. You know, I was the guy in the back of the house. Uh, the, the, the thing about me is I've just done every job out there, right? Um, I did a touch of butchering, right? I did a bunch of baking. I've done tons and tons of catering in every department, cold food, hot food, catering, and, and just every kind of restaurant you can imagine. And so um, just by virtue of that, just having done everything as a, as a gig for a while, hey, I can teach this stuff and I can lay down the practical uh, knowledge behind it that you need to know to kind of knock this out in the, in the simplest, most efficient way and still get the desired result that you want, okay? Oh boy, my oven's a little warm here and I'm starting to smell that bread. I'm, I'm gonna start melting on you guys. It smells really good. Oh yeah. Got Michael out there, got Jacob. Uh, Yessi, I see you out there. What's up, girl? Good to see you. Another former student. That's awesome. I love it. So um, let's start looking at some different knife types, okay? As I go through these knives, there's two styles of knife making that I want to kind of point out here, okay? So the first one here is a very, very simple knife, okay? This is a, a, a Forstner brand knife, okay? And these are really, let me turn this around. I think you can see that. There you go. There's the brand name Forstner. This is the Vitrino Knife Company, and they also make the Swiss Army Knife. You might be able to see that uh, uh, on that logo there. Let me get that right there. So Forstner is their kitchen line, okay? These are awesome workhorse knives, really, really big uh, uh, rounded handle that it, for my hand feels really, really good, okay? Um, this is an inexpensive, like I said, workhorse knife. Back in my day, almost every cook was using a Forstner out there on the line. This is before all those fancy little Japanese knives came along and everything, uh, but uh, uh, really inexpensive. It's This is one type of of construction here called a stamp knife, okay? This comes from just a sheet of metal. They cut out a knife shape from it, basically. They stamp that out, and then they'll put an edge on that, slap a handle on it, and you've got yourself a knife, okay? I'm trying to get a good angle here. There, that's pretty good, okay? Uh, uh, these are, like I said, inexpensive. The metal on these is fairly soft, so that means I can get an edge up really, really quickly on a knife like this, on these stamped knives. Um, the thing is, is they also go dull fast. So I'm reaching for my steel all the time when I'm working with these knives, but that doesn't mean this isn't an awesome knife. I can get a razor edge back up on this thing really, really quick if I'm constantly using my steel. Um, butcher, butcher shops and, and uh, places like that, they're all using stamp knives, okay? And we'll see a bunch of these coming forward. So that's a stamp knife. It's just one thin sheet of metal, okay? The other type of knife that we're going to, knife construction that we'll see today are forged knives, okay? And you can see this knife has a very heavy, chunky base here in the metal. It has uh, a blade going all the way through the handle. I'm sorry, what this is called a tang going all the way through the, the handle here, but it's basically one piece with the blade, right? And, um, and you can see just much heavier. Now, this is uh, constructed much more like you see the Japanese samurai sword movie where they're hammering out the metal and then they fold it and hammer it and fold it and hammer and fold and hammer and fold and hammer. And they keep doing that and they get stronger, or I'm sorry, harder and harder and harder steel. The harder the steel is, the longer it's gonna hold an edge, but um, the harder it is to get another edge up on it, okay? And so that's kind of the idea with a kind of, these are, these are more expensive. These are, again, these are forged blades and they hold an edge much longer. They are harder to sharpen and uh, much heavier. And we tend to see these when people are talking about German style knives. This is very much a German style knife right here. Very, very heavy, this section here we call a bolster and uh, a very heavy knife. This feels like, I always call this one Excalibur. This is a really heavy blade. That's a 13 inch blade right there, almost 13 inches. Okay, so um, two types of construction we're gonna see as we go through these things. The um, bolster type, I'm sorry, the sh sheet pressed steel knives and also the forged knives where it's pounded and folded, okay? There is a third type of knife just uh, uh, to be, just as a point of interest, these French style knives are kind of a, a, a forged knife, but they're much, much thinner construction, okay? This is a, a typical brand would be Sabatier or something along those lines. 
okay? Here's another example of that, kind of a thinner, what we would call a bolster right there, okay? That's an old school one. And that's another sub, uh, French style knife. Still a forged blade, okay? So as we go through these, now I'm gonna, now that we know the difference between a sheet style knife, just a pressed out inexpensive knife and a real forged blade, we're gonna look at some different types of knives, okay? I think the first type I wanna kind of look at are my chef knives since I have them right here, okay? Now a chef's knife is meant to um, do most of your cutting work in the kitchen and it's meant to, I think I'll get rid of my chair here. I, I, better, I better do this. Let me just kick this to the curb. As we're working with a chef's knife, we want that knife to be able to roll on the board in this motion right here. So that means a chef's knife is gonna have a curved edge right here. They typically have a sharp point, although some Japanese versions of these and some Chinese cleavers don't necessarily have a sharp point, but they always have a curved edge down here, okay? Um, these chef's knives also have a very deep blade here. So as I'm rolling along with my cut, my knuckles aren't hitting that cutting board, okay? And so those chef's knives are ideal for doing most of your chopping, slicing, and dicing. This is my kitchen magician, right? It does slicing, it does dicing, right? Uh, uh, they should sell these at the state fair, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, this is in your hand all day long. At, if you're a professional cook, you'll have a callus right here from that knife rubbing on your, your finger for years and years, okay? Mine is long gone since I started teaching. I don't uh, work in the kitchen as much as I used to, okay? So um, that is basically a chef's knife. Let me throw down some other chef's knives here, okay? So I showed you this one earlier. This is more of a French style. This is carbon steel, as opposed to a stainless steel. Uh, these are the old fashioned blades. And if you use these with acidic substances, they will kind of taste funky. It will taint your food. If you leave these wet, they will rust on you. Stainless steel should not rust. Here's a stainless steel, the stainless steel stamp type chef's knife that I showed you earlier. Sorry, let me check my bread guys. My apologies. I have some domestic chores to take care of here. Hope you guys are all good. Justin, good to see you out there. Boom. Let me turn that off. Uh, let's see. I got Chris Navarrete. Hey, what's up, brother? Somebody from the day job back in the day, right? Uh, uh, Halpin is out there. Good to see you, young lady. Awesome. Uh, all right. So we were looking at chef's knives. Sorry about that. Now, this third chef's knife, that uh, press knife, this also has an optional a uh, uh, partial serrated blade here. Uh, these knives are excellent for a pantry station where you're making, you know, doing lots of salads and making sandwiches. These are also good for a zombie apocalypse, apocalypse knife. It, if it ever happens, this knife will do it all, okay? So that's what I'm gonna have out there. Let's see, um, I have other ones. Here's kind of a cool one. This is about a 15 inch long carbon steel chef's knife that came from uh, my family, somebody in my family owned a candy store shot way, way, way back in the day in the 40s. And so it can do that. It's good for cutting pans of fudge like straight across and things like that, you know? Um, so uh, very, very interesting historical, still a chef's knife though, right? And then uh, let's see, I think that's all we will uh, show you on the chef's knives there. You guys get the idea. It's got that really, really deep blade so your knuckles don't get knocked on the counter and you can just chop in that rolling motion uh, uh, with your knife, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Right now, we're just looking at different blades. Okay, let's see. Next, I think I want to look at, uh, let's look at a couple of Japanese knives because some of these are similar to my, uh, to my chef's knives, okay? So right here, I have a sushi blade. This is a forged blade made out of carbon steel. This is probably the most expensive knife that I own right here. Uh, I only own these three Japanese style knives, by the way, and one of them is not even Japanese. Um, but uh, anyway, going back to this one, um, this blade had the slightest, slightest imperfection in it. Otherwise, this would have been a thousand dollar blade right here. And so um, uh, one thing to take note on this, this is sharpened only on one side. And when we sharpen these knives, we do it on a very, very fine stone. We'll talk about that when we get back to it, okay? But that's your sashimi blade, right? That you're seeing a lot of those long, smooth cuts and laying it out uh, uh, on a counter, right? Um, 
This is a Japanese Sentuku style knife, and this is built like a chef's knife. You can do that rolling motion with that one. And uh, one thing to point out, it has those little dents in the blade, and those are called cullens, K-U-L-L-E-N-S, cullens, and those are meant to break the suction of the food against your knife blade so it doesn't stick to your blade. If you've ever done like cucumbers or something, cucumbers will drive you crazy. They're all sticking to your blade and everything, and those little dents in the knife break the suction and those cucumbers will just fall away off of your knife. You'll see knives with dents in them too, hammered dents and things like that. All of those will do the same thing, keeping things from sticking to your knife blade, okay? I've got one new blade that I'm still getting used to, but this is just a tiny little slicer utility knife that I like, but that's another Japanese style knife. Really a uh, full-size version of this would be a chef's knife, okay, basically. Okay, so those are my three Japanese style blades. Um, big thing to remember with Japanese style blades, many, many of them are sharp only on one side. Okay, kind of an interesting point. Let me, uh, let's see, let's take a look at some butcher and slicing knives. Okay, a few slicing knives first. Throw these on down. These are kind of uh, fun. And these are for long, thin cuts, especially this one right here. This is an old carbon steel slicing knife. And the idea with this is I can do thin slices of something like uh, smoked salmon or something by laying it down on that salmon, bending that blade, and then just slicing across it. And I can get paper thin slices with a super thin slicing blade, okay? Here's a modern stamped metal version of that. It's got the little safety tip on it. This would be a good one for your little Hofbrau, Sam's Hofbrau carving station, right? That thin blade, uh, you can get super thin slices. And one of the things that we always say out in the industry, thin slices, big smiles, okay? That's what we're all doing out there on that carving station. Cheers, everybody. It's Quarantine Kitchen Happy Hour. Uh, it's Monday for 415 and we're doing it. We're laying it down. Christina is out there. Good to see you. And Chris Navarrete, thanks for stopping by. Mr. Derek's out there. Nice. Too much tang. Very nice. Nice language there, sir. Looking good. Evan's out there. Carl's out there. Thanks a lot for stopping by, guys. Cheers and uh, Nostroia. It's, it's great to see everybody out there. We're talking blades of glory here today. I'm just going through some of the knives in my house because people were asking questions about it. So we'll just keep on going with these guys. Oh, uh, I'll show you a few more of these slicers, okay? This one is kind of another long utility knife, beautiful for carving, um, you know, peeling melons and things like that. I wanted one of these knives for years and I finally got one. This guy is so versatile. I can do, it's a little bit flexible. I can do some carving of like little prime ribs and things like that. Uh, and also, like I said, I use this all the time for cold kitchen work, cheese trays and, and fruit trays and things like that. Tons of that stuff in the hotels that I worked in. Uh, and then finally, here's a serrated slicer. This is uh, uh, what um, most, this is what started this whole conversation. Now this slicer right here is known as a bread slicer. That's what Amber was originally asking about. So that's kind of the style of knife if you were looking for a bread knife. But if you're looking for something a little more versatile, you might think of a longer blade. Usually you want a blade, I like a, a serrated knife blade that's about 12 inches long or so. And that way, if I'm doing cake work, I can slice through the, the cakes all the way through. This knife's really too short to get through cake. So I like something a little bit longer than this guy. Okay. Um, one thing about, there, there's kind of a, a thing about serrated blades, right? Now, this is a forged serrated knife. It's not a super expensive one. This is a Mercer brand. This is from uh, the culinary kits that we would hand out in culinary school. I went up with a couple of that, a couple of those dudes uh, at the end, right? And so um, these types of knives are fairly expensive, you know, compared to that stamp type of knife. The thing is with uh, serrated knives, they're very difficult to resharpen. So for many, many years, and I, I think to this day, I try to buy a decent quality stamped knife, uh, serrated knife for my bread work and all of that. And then when it gets dull, I can just throw it away. I didn't spend that much on it and I can get another one. So I'll spend like, I'll, I'll get like a $25, $30 one and, and I'll be good for, you know, several years, eight, nine years or whatever. And then I'll just get rid of it and get another one. Okay. And a couple of people were even alluding to that on the thread. I think Amy, uh, uh, Amy was saying something like that on the thread too. Uh, get kind of a cheaper one, treat them as disposable blades. It's kind of up to you whether you get like a good quality or kind of more of a disposable idea. 
Okay. So those are my slicers. That's kind of what started the whole conversation. This is kind of the length of a serrated slicer I like because I can get through a cake with that guy. And I love these flexi guys. Love them. Next, I've got some, let me get organized here. Next, I'm going to bring out my butcher tool. Two weeks ago, I did a butcher class for a couple of weeks. I broke down a goat in my little kitchen here. If you guys missed that, uh, check it out. Look it up, okay? It was pretty cool. I ran through the butcher tools. I'm just going to do some of them again real quick, okay? Just pointing out the main thing with butcher tools is the commonality, that rounded tip on all of these tools, okay? When we're doing butchering, it's a lot of that, you know, getting in. Sorry, let me adjust that. But it's a lot of like getting into like doing surgery, right? You're doing long, smooth strokes to kind of open up a muscle area or something or go in between two muscles. Um, uh, we use these larger knives for cutting, doing long, smooth strokes to cut steaks, right? I've got a big ribeye right here and I'll just shave steaks off of that thing, cut, you know, inch and a half ribeye, ribeye steaks or whatever inch and a half, that's pretty thick. Uh, anyway, um, that's what that dude's for. Also, I use this guy a lot for cleaning salmon, okay? When I'm breaking salmon down, it's a good one for that. I've got a smaller version of that one too, made out of carbon steel. That's the one I broke out last week, okay? Um, let's see. These are stamped versions of butcher knives, and this is like industry standard stuff. Uh, um, you'll see these plastic handles. It's It's got a little bit of grip to it. They're easy to hold on to, easy to maintain, sanitize, clean, all of that. And it's you can just keep them sharp as long as you're using your sharpening steel along with the job. They'll stay like a razor all day long. All your butcher guys are using these stamp knives like this. I rarely, rarely, here's one version of a, of a forged butcher knife or forged boning knife here. It's more of a flexible fillet knife actually, uh, pretty much. But um, I, I, I've never seen anything like that in like a butcher shop or anything like that. It's all this kind of stuff, maybe wood handled versions of that, okay? So those are your butcher tools. We're still looking at different kinds of knives. I've gone through all the big dudes. I wanna show you some little blades now, okay? Um, I've got some versions of stamped and forged paring knives here, okay? Here's a forged parry knife. Here's another forged parry knife. This is kind of a four-incher, almost a almost a utility knife. Let me get that back up here a little bit if I can. Uh, let's see. And this is another forged version of a paring knife. This hooked one is called a bird's bee. And I'm going to show you a cut in a little while. It's for doing paring knife work where you're kind of curling your hands. Okay, I'll show you a cut that we used to do in culinary school. It drove the students crazy. They loved it. Anyway, uh, let's see, here's another one, okay? Beautiful little paring knife. That's a very nice thing, right? Uh, very nice shape right there. And I like the length of that one. I can do a lot with this guy. I think that's three inches. Um, now, here are some uh, uh, kind of stamp knife versions. These are the ones I always use in my home kitchen. They're super, super lightweight. I love them. I can get an edge up on them and nothing flat. And, uh, you know, it's just very soft metal that, that I can work with. These are also that Vitrino company, good working knife, okay? Here's another Vitrino with a wood handle, and that's a bird's beak. This is another one that's super lightweight. I love the feel of this guy in my hand. I like a heavy chef's knife, and I like a light paring knife, and I don't know why that is. Here's an old Chicago cutlery one that's shaped like a butcher knife. That's shaped like a boning knife, right? Sometimes when I'm breaking chickens, I'll bust this guy out and use him like a little scalpel to kind of pop my uh, leg joints and things like that, okay? So, um, hey, these are all paring knives. I'm going to go ahead and hang on to maybe uh, uh, my red one and my little bird's beak for later. I'm going to hang on to one chef's knife, and we are going to go through some knife cuts here in just a minute. Let me uh, go ahead and get some of these knives out of the way. Oh, I had one more thing to go over. Another person was asking about scissors. So just, uh, they were asking what, what our favorite pair of scissors was around here. So I just, I don't have a favorite pair. Well, I do, but you can't have it, okay? If there's only one in the world like it, okay? But basically, um, here's a couple of pairs, okay? Here's like a standard pair of shears that we were handing out at culinary school for years, okay? It's pretty solid. Henkel had a version of this. They're kind of Chinese made. Comes apart and really easy to clean, super lightweight. And yeah, this this will cut through chicken bones, no problem. And it's very, very light weight and uh like I said, it comes apart for easy cleaning you can't go wrong a uh, great pair of shears it's not like those old-fashioned all metal ones now here's a more modern version by fiskers i think it's swiss or uh, i'm sorry swedish 
uh, Scandinavian scissor company. And this one also comes apart and it's just a little bit lighter. You'd have to be pretty skillful to break a chicken down with this pair of scissors. But this is kind of my favorite pair of go-to scissors because everything else in the kitchen is so much easier. These cut better than these guys do for general purposes. These are good for chickens, not so good for trying to cut a piece of paper or something, right? And then finally, um, this pair that I have is actually, I taught culinary school and there were parts left in my drawer all the time. And so these are two different brands of scissors. This is Messermeister and it's kind of this old school style with a little screwdriver on the end of it. And this is just our culinary uh, 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 school handout. It, it was a no name kind of a thing. And I would have tons of lefties and tons of righties that wouldn't fit together. And these two happen to fit together. And when they do, since they don't weren't really made for each other, they fit together really tight and they cut awesome. Okay, so that's my favorite pair. It's made out of two different pairs of scissors and nobody else can have that. Okay, <laughs> I love those guys. Anyway, let me get all this stuff cleaned up and we'll start getting into some knife cuts and safety and stance and the grip. I also got to pull my loaf of bread out here in a minute, guys. This is good stuff. That's, uh, that's the knife I want right there. Here we go. So I've got my chef's knife here, okay? Um, when we're looking at the chef's knife, looking at the um, the basic layout of the chef's knife, I always had to do this in culinary school. I know I thought it, thought it was so silly all the time. So here's the pointy part, right? The tip, right? And then we have the edge, the cutty part, right? Um, this heavy part I mentioned before, this is called the bolster. And this is something we actually, you can get a little grip on that thing, actually. It feels good in your hand and it gives the knife some stability if you happen to have a bolster on your knife. The piece of metal that's going all the way through the handle here is called the tang. And when we're buying a good quality knife, we are looking for a full tang. A lesser quality knife will be like two thirds tang and the only two rivets will be going through that metal, okay? So you want a knife with a full tang on there, okay? And then finally, uh, you got the, the blunt end, okay? And those are the parts of the knife. I always felt funny doing that, right? Um, now, as we are um, working with this knife, some of the things to um, think about, we want to um, keep those knives super, super sharp is the thing. If uh, that's, that's the biggest thing for safety. If you cut yourself, you wanna cut yourself with a sharp knife, not a dull knife, right? A dull knife is gonna make a really, really nasty, ugly cut, but a sharp knife is gonna just kind of really cut cleanly, right? The other thing about it is if I'm using a dull knife, I've got to put tons of pressure on that thing. I'm wrenching on it. And if I slip or something like that, the item I'm cutting rolls, I'm going to just, if I cut my, it's just going to go way into me. If I've got a sharp razor sharp scalpel of a knife, I can just cut through easily and gently. And it's so pleasant. I mean, it's it's just like, it's a lot like if you ever hit like a baseball just perfectly in the sweet spot. I'm not a big sports guy, okay? But but I am aware of this phenomenon, okay? <laughs> you know, you, you hit a baseball right in the sweet spot. It almost feels like nothing. A golf ball is the same way. If you really nail it perfectly, you don't even feel it, right? And a good sharp knife is just like that. It flies through stuff. If you ever see those, those uh, Chinese sword fighting movies, it's like that. You can just zip through all of your work effortlessly like you're floating, okay? So first rule of knife safety is have those blades super sharp. You're so much less, so much less likely or so less likely, uh, I don't know how to say this, uh, so less likely to cut yourself seriously, okay? Um, let's see, carry it tip down. When I'm holding my knife, it's always, ooh, this is kind of hard to, let me kind of put it down here. I got this, okay, hold on, we're on break. We're on bread break. Let me pull this bread. I'm sure it's probably done. All right, we were talking about safety. We're doing a safety jam, okay? So uh, as we're carrying a knife, if I'm walking around a kitchen, I carry it down at my side and I also announce my presence, right? So if I'm walking around a kitchen, it's like, hey, I got a knife, hey, blade there. It's funny, you can't see my head. It makes it even more dangerous looking. Headless man coming through with a knife, right? And so that's kind of how you want to carry a knife. I'd rather have a knife cut me than cut someone else. So I carry it up against me, okay? Um, never try and catch a dropped knife. If you drop a knife, just jump away. Okay. That's kind of the game. Let me adjust that and do it again. Jump away. Okay. That's what you're going to do whenever a knife falls on the ground. Don't even try and catch it. That's only for professionals that do chainsaw juggling and things like that. Okay. Um, 
cut away from yourself typically okay it's kind of hard in some jobs butchering and things like that but generally speaking you're cutting away from yourself use the right tool for the right job you don't use this guy to open a can for instance right and i also don't use this guy to break a chicken i'm going to use a boning knife for that right the tip of this guy that that sharp or um, uh, extreme tip on this guy is going to rip my chicken apart i want that that rounded edge like we saw in all of those boning knives okay um Another thing is don't put these things in the sink, right? Underneath some suds. It's just like you don't want to throw glass, glassware underneath the suds, right? If it breaks, you're going to cut yourself really bad and say, okay, and same thing with a knife. So these are always kind of set off to the side, wash separately or better yet, when I use a knife, I wash the thing and I put it away. Hey, what a concept, you know, wash it, dry it, put it away and, and it's ready for the next time, okay? So um, that's kind of the, uh, uh, the safety jam. Let me get another little sip. It's getting warm in here. I still got this oven going in here. I want to kick the thing off. I want my bread to be done. Right. And we're going to uh, show you the grip next and how to hold a chef's knife and how to run through some of these cuts. We're, it's really not a very long show today. Mm. We're not really cooking today. We're just playing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Super cool. All right. So um, first thing, before you can even pick up your knife, it's just like the military, you can't touch the gun until you can stand straight, right? And that's the first thing here. You want to check your body position. So let me just kind of show you, you know, I'm setting up my cutting board here. There's a little non-slip mat underneath it. And so it, it's really distracting when you're trying to cut and your board is slipping all over the place, right? The next thing is I'm, I've got my board squared off on the edge of the table and everything. Thing, and it's not all catawampus or twisted or anything. And then when we go from that board, once that's set up correctly, I am going to square off my feet on that board exactly straight, and I'm going to square off my body with that board. What I don't want to do is twist up my body and try to work like sideways on this thing while I'm cooking over here or something like that. I want to be completely straight on my board. If you're, if you're working all day long at a cutting board and your spine is twisted the whole time, how long do you think you're going to want last out there, right? And so um, we always stand straight and stand tall, okay? The next thing is once you've squared it off in your board and you're standing tall, remember to stay loose, okay? So get tall and then who kind of breathe a little bit and loosen up, okay? If you're super sit stiff, you're likely to make one of those little slips, okay? And so um, once you're squared off on the board and you're feeling all loose and goose and everything, um, now let's take a look at the grip, okay? So we'll go down here, kind of get in the, let's get that in the right spot, okay? So with the grip, I tend to just place my index finger right in front of the bolster. That's usually where most knives are balanced um, the best. And so in most of knives, I can just kind of lay the knife right there and it'll balance. This one's a little heavy on the back end. And so it always kind of falls down right there. So on this knife, I just lay my finger right ahead of that heavy part of the blade that's a bolster, that's called the bolster, okay? The other, uh, my thumb, the other finger, the thick one, opposing thumb here, um, it's going to just hold the other side of the blade. And I want to point out my other fingers are really not doing anything. They're just kind of laying there going along for the ride. We actually hold the blade of the knife. The handle is just there to kind of steer the tail into this thing. Most of the grips right there. Remember I told you that cooks all get a callus right there. It's from holding that blade like that. And I know it feels funny to do this at first, but after a while, it's just a natural thing for you, okay? That's really where the balance point of most blades is, okay? Now, um, let's see. Once you've got that down, the index finger and thumb, the rest of those fingers are hanging loosely. Remember to breathe. The next part is the other hand, and we call this the claw, okay? Arr, arr. Okay, and the reason we call it the claw is because we are curling our fingertips inward underneath there. So when I'm holding something, my fingertips are curled under. Earlier, I was showing you that kind of chugga chugga motion, that rolling motion with the chef's knife. And if I can roll that chef's knife and keep my fingertips curled all the way underneath, you see how that is, right? If I can keep them curled underneath, then I'm never going to cut myself. And I can do this all day long. I'm not looking at you guys. I'm not looking at my hands. I'm looking at the computer screen over here, right? And so that is the idea here. Let's go through all of this again, okay? Find the balance point. It's usually right ahead of the bolster. And then go ahead and put your thumb on the other side of that, okay? 
The other three fingers are just going to be kind of hanging loosely. You could even stick a dainty little pinky out on the side if you want to, okay? The other hand is going to create a claw. You're going to curl your tips, your fingertips all the way underneath, and you are going, your hand is going to be parallel to the knife blade. Now, one tip for this, the best way to keep those fingers parallel, here, let me show you this something. Let, let's back up. The reason we want to keep our fingers parallel or our knife hand parallel to this is that if I start turning my hand thusly and try and hold on to a knife, this is where I'm going to rise up and cut something over here. There's something hanging out here, okay? But if I have the claw going perfectly, that knife rides right on those knuckles. You guys see that other angle there? It's just perfect, right? And so one thing I need to show you is Look at where my elbow is out here. It's sticking straight out to the side. If I bring my elbow into my body, my knife hand is, is turning and that's where I'm gonna start getting that thumb if I'm not careful, okay? So keep that elbow way out to your side and that uh, claw right up against your knife blade. And that's kind of the cutting motion you're gonna see here in a minute, okay? back up. Before we get into cuts, let's talk about uh, knife sharpening and care and feeding of your knife, okay? So I think that's what I want to get into next. So knife maintenance. Here we go. So my knife was just rolling on the counter there. You saw it on the cutting board. And then when it was doing that, every time it was doing that, it was getting duller. If I look at the edge of this knife under a microscope, I am going to see tiny, tiny little teeth, just like a saw blade, okay? And every time I mash my knife down to cut something, I'm mashing the teeth of my saw blade. And so what I will do is use a sharpening steel or really a honing steel to kind of sharpen those, those teeth again, okay? And it looks like this. Let me grab one. Here's, here's actually a few different versions, okay? Here's a very large one. This is usually called a butcher's steel, but it's quite large. Um, this little one is what I'm kind of used to in a butcher shop, just kind of a smaller one. I'm going to use that one today. And the idea here is we run the knife along the steel on either side. And what that's going to do is it's going to realign those little saw teeth that I was talking about, okay? So this is called stealing your blade. Sorry. And we'll do this, uh, you know, eight to 10 times. I'll use my knife again, chop, 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 chop. I'll pick this up and do it eight to 10 times. And I'll maintain a razor edge on my knife by doing this. This is imperative that you're using this thing all the time. One great thing about this thing is it's um, magnetic. So it can kind of pick up certain things. Uh, uh, I could almost... This one might, yeah, this one's picking up that one. They're magnetic, so any little burrs of the knife might be able to stick to this. And when I'm done with this guy, I always want to wipe it off. And I always want to wipe off my blade as well because of those little burrs of metal that I just removed, okay? Now let's take a look at that stealing again. I want to, I want to kind of be up here for this. And when I'm doing this, we're looking at about a 15 degree angle, okay? So I'm kind of showing you the angle right there straight on. I'm hoping you guys can see this. I'm going down on either side to do that. As I'm doing this, I want to kind of choke down. I want to get down on my handle here. And I want to choke down on the handle of my knife as well. And what I do is I start at the tip of the steel with the base of my knife. And I'll go on one side, base and tip, all the way down tip to base. I use the whole blade and I use the whole steel. I'm over on the other side right now. And I'm going to do the same thing. Use the whole blade, use the whole steel. And I'm alternating sides. And I'm going in slow motion as I steal my blade, OK? Again, about a 15 degree angle. I always try and use the same angle when I'm doing this. And if someone else picks up my knife and steals it, and they, they have the wrong angle, now my knife's all out of whack. And I got to work this thing for a while to get it back, OK? So that's all about just realigning the edge. After I use my knife for a while though, it's gonna get really, really dull and the steel's not gonna do it for me anymore, okay? And so that's when I really need to hone my blade, to sharpen it. I'm gonna bring out a sharpening stone for this, okay? It's sitting right here. And what's gonna go underneath it, Nawe's out there, Brandon's out there, Art's out there, hi, hey everybody. This is awesome, I see all these old students, so great guys. Oh yeah. So I'm going to throw down a wet towel. Let me kind of show you this. 
And that's where my stone's gonna sit. Wet towel, it's not gonna slide around. Now, this is a, a two-sided stone, okay? I got a coarse side and I've got a fine side. I don't think, uh, unless you're sharpening chisels for the wood shed, I don't think you need the coarse blade. I don't, I don't know if I've ever used a coarse edge. Oh, you know, if I break the tip of a knife, I might use a coarse edge, but otherwise we're using the fine edge for our, um, for our knives, okay? Our knife edges, I should say, okay? So back to it. So I've got the fine side of my stone, and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to throw down some mineral oil. You can buy honing oil, but it's just mineral oil. Typically, it just costs more, okay? So mineral oil is very inexpensive at the uh, grocery store. And I'm going to go ahead and throw down a little oil. And by the way, you can also you just use water on these stones. Very important, you don't use other oils that are heavier. They might... Um, you know, you, you use a, a heavy oil, it's going to kind of gum up in there with all of the stone and metal particles and everything. And after a while, your stone won't sharpen anything anymore. It'll be varnished because all of the pores are full of gunk, okay? So um, mineral oil is the thing that'll keep it from gumming up. Mr. Andrews out there, good to see you, sir. Busy man, taking time out. Awesome. So right now, here, let me get it down there for you. Right now, I'm smooshing around that oil. That's a thirsty stone. Let me get a little more down there. She's a thirsty one. And we'll just do a little bit of this, okay? I don't really need a big sharpening on my blade right now. So I'm kind of wiping off that oil. Now, earlier I was used, I was going from my base to my tip on the steel. Uh, I was going from my base to the tip on the steel using the whole steel. On this, I'm gonna do the exact same thing. Going from base to tip, on the stone, I'm using the whole blade and I'm using the whole stone base. The tip is coming off over here. And I'm just gonna alternate those. One thing I should show you is I'm standing way back, okay? If I'm standing up here, I can't work this stone, okay? So I'm standing way back. I got these big gangly elbows. One side and the other. The angle I'm using, 15 degrees. If I'm using it on my steel, I want to use that same angle on my stone. And I just keep doing this. And I'll tell you what, if you're keeping up stealing your blade, if you maintain your knife, hey, about a dozen strokes on this thing. And that's all she wrote. You know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good there. I really didn't feel the need to do that much here. Let's do a couple more strokes just for fun. Okay. See that again. Again, I want the base of the knife starting in the, the right corner here. And the tip is going to come off the left corner base of the knife is starting in the left corner on this side now, and the tip is coming off the right corner, okay? And it's that way every time, okay? When you see a Japanese person sharpening a knife, they're going lengthwise and going back and forth like so. And they do it, I, I don't wanna do it on my blade, but um, they only do it on one side, okay? And they usually use a piece of like, the stone is more like jade, very, very smooth. And they just work it and work it in that knife hole. I don't think I've ever sharpened that sashimi blade I have. It's never needed it. Okay, so um, I hope you guys kind of get the idea there. Whatever I'm doing on the steel, that's what I'm doing on the stone and vice versa. Same angle and same using that whole long stroke idea, right? Use the whole thing. Uh, what I don't want to do is just wear away the metal in the middle of my blade. I want to wear it down evenly, okay? That's the idea. So let me move this stuff out of the way. Ah, let me show you one more thing I just thought of. Um, let's see. This is another type of a steel. This is called a diamond steel, and it's uh, it's a piece of aluminum with industrial diamond dust embedded in it, evidently, okay? And so this guy will work just like that sharpening stone did. If I, want, if I just want to kind of do a quickie, I don't have a stone or something, I can do my sharpening on this guy. And this thing will shave metal off your knife. You don't want to use this thing too much, okay? I think I got to pull my bread. We got to check this thing again, okay, guys? Sorry. Whoop, whoop, it's bread time. Doing a night class while I'm doing bread. Do, 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 it's bread time. Yeah. Writing songs while I'm making up shows. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. We're done.
I want to start knocking out some knife work here, okay? We are going to start doing some chef's knife stuff. I'll, I'll kind of show you some of the cuts that we show the students just to kind of get that muscle memory going, right? A lot of the cuts aren't so important uh, uh, in everyday life. For instance, you know, if I'm working at kind of a funky little hippie restaurant, I don't necessarily have to be able to make perfect dices all day, but I do have to have consistent sizes, right? So things cook evenly and they look nice and, and things like that, right? Um, uh, so I am going to kind of show you some of the uh, less practical cuts, right? The ones that we teach to show muscle memory and knife control, hand-eye coordination, things like that. Uh, um, things that will get you used to using a paring knife, you know, that's another cut that we do. We have a paring knife cut, right? And so I want to kind of show you that culinary technique. Uh, uh, you know, it just kind of comes in handy. And, and some of this stuff, though, is essential kitchen technique that you got to know just to, you know, start a pasta sauce. I was doing some of this just last week for uh, my... My tomato sauce class, right? So let me just get a few uh, little little things to play with here. Oh, I was gonna do this, right? I was gonna roast off a bell pepper uh, while we're at it, okay? Bell pepper, um, if you have a gas stove, you are just gonna set it on a burner and uh, let that burner go, okay? You're gonna char it on all sides. I've covered this in another class, but I, I wanted to have a bell pepper for dinner. I had it around, you know, so we're gonna do this today, okay? So I'm gonna char this guy and we'll show you how to clean that guy a little bit later, okay? Um, let's see, while that's going, we are going to do some knife cuts. Now, some of the cuts that I want to show you, I was mentioning the culinary school cuts. So I would always kind of bust out this little model kit here. Let me show it to you. And this has all your, your standard like French culinary school cuts on it, right? Uh, in 3D, as you can see, right? And so right here, those little green lines, okay? That's a fine julienne. And then in the center, the middle green line, well, uh, middle green line is a regular julienne. And then the big green line, or big stick, that's called a batonet, okay? Or actually, which means little stick, right? At the end of each one of those, there are little dices that are coming off of the end, right? That batonet has a little dice at the end of it, a little yellow one, that, that is the same diameter, right? And so I can make a bunch of these batonets and then cut them into those little dices, right? And if I make a bunch of these juliennes, I can cut them into that little brunoise is what we call that cut. And then that fine julienne, as I cut those up, into dices, I can cut those up into fine brunoise or brunoise, okay? Um, so those are some of the cuts I wanted to show you right out of the gate, okay? Um, we'll come back to some others in a minute. And we're looking at that. Notice I'm charring that, okay? I'm looking for a lot more blackening. That's what I'm looking for. Beautiful. All right. I think I'll work with a little carrot to show you these cuts, okay? Now for the carrot, um, I like to peel these guys and that, uh, I don't really like to eat the peel. It's very bitter. If you've ever tasted a carrot peel, it's pretty bitter. So I like to kick those to the curb. I don't even like to throw them in my stock pot to tell you the truth. So those are gonna go bye-bye. And then anything I cut off of here is gonna be usable if I get rid of that peel, okay? If I leave the peel on there, it's not really good for cooking. I like to get rid of that. Okay, so there goes all the peel. And now the first step, and again, I think what I will do is start making, I think I'll make a julienne here, okay? And I'll make a batonet out of a potato, I think, okay? So this julienne, the first step for that is squaring off your vegetable, okay? I'm gonna take a little section of my carrot and then I'm just gonna cut that and then square it off, okay? Now this julienne isn't very long. I think that's like two to two and a half inches or something like that. Um, so I might cut mine a little bit longer. I'm not in love with these lengths right here. Let me uh, turn my pepper. That's not, not looking too bad. Oh, get it over there. And I'm just using my hands to do that. You move quickly. Okay, we're squaring off this carrot now. I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna grab my chef's knife and I'm going to lay it on my index finger. I'm gonna place my thumb on the other side and my other fingers are going along for the ride, okay? They're barely holding on back there. I'm gonna square off my body to my cutting board and I'm gonna remove the end of my carrot. And then I'm gonna cut about a three inch piece. I like kind of a longer one, okay? And I might cut another one. Let's do that, okay? The rest of these guys, I'm just gonna hang on to for the, for the stock pot. We'll make some money out of that. Okay, we're still talking about squaring off our vegetables. The next thing we're gonna do, I'll stand one of those guys up and I'm going to get my claw, I'm gonna engage my claw hand, curl those fingertips underneath. I've got the grip going on my knife here and I'm gonna remove one side of this carrot. 
When I do that, very important, push it right over on that side. And now you just made a kickstand for that carrot. It's not going to go rolling around on you. Okay. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the, the next face off. Boom. And you guys see, I've got two squared sides on that. You guys see that? Okay. You see where we're going with this. I'm going to push it to the flat side. I'm going to square off another one. And then am I going to push it to the other side? No, I'm going to push it back the other way. I could cut that off, but that leaves me less to hang on to. If I leave it on there, I've got a little bit more to hang on to. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Now I've got a squared off piece of carrot, except for on one side. I got a little handle to hang on to. And I'm going to be cutting some of these julienne pieces out of them. That's the center line there. Okay. So that is uh, one eighth of an inch wide. I'm not going to break out a ruler. I just kind of want it in the ballpark here, quite honestly. Check out my pepper, looking good. We're still charring. Multitasking, right? Right, Stim? Stim's is out. Stim's out there. Ruben's out there. Andrew, thanks for hanging, brother. Okay, now that I've got it squared off, I'm holding on to that fourth side, and I'm just going to cut a slab off of there that's one eighth of an inch thick. And I think I'll do another. And I'll do another all the way through. Cut a bunch of slabs, plonk, planks, I usually call them actually. And good thing I didn't cut that last piece off because that's just what I was hanging on to there, okay? That little claw was able to hang on to it. Now in culinary school, I'm looking for perfect pieces, right? And these are feeling pretty good. They got out of, out of line there. This guy here on the end is about the thickest one that I got, but the rest of these guys are feeling pretty, pretty uh, consistent, okay? So next thing I'm gonna do is go across the top. If I wanna make them perfect, I'm only gonna do one at a time. So I'll do one of those first. You can see these carrots will curl on you as you cut them. But that is your julienne, okay? Boom, boom, boom. And I can just keep on rolling through that. We used to do knife cut skills, you know, hey, give me 20 pieces of julienne and 20 pieces of this and 20 pieces of that. And you have this much time, right? So you guys got it? There's some nice little juliennes. And that's an example of uh, kind of using that square cut. Now, if I wanted to make the next cut down, the brunoise or brunoise, sorry, I'll take some of these guys and cut straight across. Ooh, see, I've got a little imperfect one. I'll get rid of that. But I take these little guys and cut straight across and I've got very tiny dices. And I might sprinkle them into a consomme or onto a plate of greens, right? In the 80s, we had all kinds of Brunoise cuts going. Not so much anymore. Okay, pepper's still charring. I'm getting all sweaty standing next to this flame. Sorry, guys. Whoop, whoop. Okay, so there's one of your, there's two cuts right there. I've got Julienne and I've got some um, Brunoise right there. I think I'll kick some of these pieces to the curb. Maybe hang on to some of it. But I think you guys get the idea. Very simple stuff. I'm going to set these down on another tray and we'll look at them later. Now with these planks, I can do other cuts like Paisan where I'm doing this. Pretty fancy, huh? And they're just flat. Okay. Going back to 1970. Okay. Very nice. But that's kind of a thing. If I have a round one of these, if I just kind of punch them out with a round cutter, we call it a lozenge. Okay. And they actually have some of those cuts there. There's the square, right? The paisan. Different types of paisan that's actually on there. So let me throw those guys down. And we'll see those later. I'm going to do a little cleanup. I got some scrap here to grab. So uh, don't go away. We got a pepper going over here. It's very exciting. All of this knife work. Blades of glory. Sing it. Sing it loud. Oh, yeah. Lots of charring. Ow, ow, ow. Ow, ow, ow. Just a little bit more. You got to move fast. I don't have the hot hands like I used to. Let's take a look at a potato. I'm going to do another block cut, and we're going to do a, a baton here. Let me, uh, be, I'll be right back. All right. We're making sticks here, okay? Uh, really, what we're making is French fries. This is your French fry cut. If I can show you the batonette, it's the gr big green line right there. It's a French fry, basically, okay? We might cut ours a little bit longer, but here she goes, okay? I'm come, uh, kind of coming on down. You can kind of see my potato there. And uh, just a minute, let me get this uh, bell pepper out of here. I think my camera's overheating. 
So my bell pepper, I'm just going to put it into a cup or a bowl or something like that. And I invert that on the counter. So I'll show you. I'm going to set it right there. OK, and it's going to steam inside of there. The outside of the skin charred, but the inside of the pepper is not really cooked or softened up or anything. It's still like raw bell pepper. Now it's getting a chance to kind of steam and soften a little bit. And in a little while, we scrape off all the black and it all goes away. We've skinned the pepper and given it a much better flavor. It's delicious. I, I don't like a raw bell pepper, but I love a roasted bell pepper. So that's what we're going to have in a minute. Let's go back to this uh, potato here. So the first cut here, just like that carrot, we're going to square this guy off, OK? Uh, for this one, I'm just going to cut off both ends. And then, again, I'm, I'm squared off on my board. I want to remind everybody, I'm holding my knife properly, OK? I'm holding on just above that bolster there. The other three fingers are barely along for the ride. I'm really holding that blade, OK? I've got my. Uh, claw hand engaged and my elbow is way out to my side. Check that out. You got to have that elbow out there. It's just going to curl on you. Okay. So elbow out. Now I'm going to cut one side of this potato off one edge from corner from corner to corner, basically. And then I'm going to push it over onto the flat side and it's going to stay put. You got a kickstand. I'm going to cut another piece corner to corner, push it over. And then I cut another piece. And again, on the potato, you can really see why I don't really want to get rid of that last piece, okay? That's a piece that I can hold on to, okay? And so I'm going to hold, uh, leave that last piece on there. I am going to trim a little more of this side off, get rid of that peel there. Culinary school cuts are very wasteful. You would never waste this much at home. I've already kind of wasted all that, okay? Okay, so I've squared off that potato. Now I'm making quarter inch cuts, so I'm going across about a quarter inch. And again, and just nice straight cuts with that blade. It's straight too. Can't hardly help but make straight cuts here. And I think I can get one more plank, la plancha, okay? If I lay them all down, oh my gosh, perfectly flat. I'm feeling really good about this. I'm gonna get rid of that fourth side, okay? Again, we're cutting batonet here. That's the cut. I can go across the top and again, quarter inch size. Boom, across the top. And if that's going too slow for me, and I'll get rid of that funky one, OK? I turn them on their side, and they're all working for me. They're all perfect, OK? Um, if it's not working for me to go that slow, I can stack these guys. I, I, I go more than two, and they start slipping around. And it's very difficult to get clean cuts. When we were uh, uh, you know, testing students on this stuff, we were looking for accuracy. By the way, there's a little peel in there I'm going to be trimming out. We don't want that stuff around. Those would be too small to use. And then I got one more piece. When they, uh, you have pieces stick to your blade, you can use them as a guide to cut the next piece, by the way. That one won't work. And so I've got some pretty good pieces going across there. These guys are a little bigger than the rest. I got a little wide there. Boop. I don't know. I won't worry about them. OK, so this side, I have some funkiness going on. I'm going to get rid of. I don't even I'll get rid of that whole piece. Yeah, so I will start dicing these guys. Once you have these batons, you go across it quarter, uh, quarter inch wide. And now you've got your quarter inch uh, dice. This is called a small dice by Americans. This is called a Macedoine by the French Macedoine. Small dice. OK, quarter inch. So there's a bunch of small dice there. And I'll throw a few of those baton cuts over there, too. These are all your straight cuts from culinary school. These guys, I'm just going to kick them to the curb. For now, I'll do a little something uh, for breakfast out of them. OK, so um, those were my two square cut potatoes. And I have them kind of sitting on a. Uh, uh, board over here, and I'm going to just keep on collecting cuts as we go through, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and do a chopped onion, okay? Before I do this one, whenever I do these CCLA onions, I always, always steal my blade. Let's see, where did I put it? I kept it right here. Sorry, guys. And so, use the whole steel. Use the whole blade. About a 15-degree angle, okay? It's not a very uh, um, deep angle at all. 
very shallow angle. That's probably enough, okay? Oh, it feels like a razor, it feels so good. Yes, okay. So I'm gonna grab an onion, okay? I, I do this one a lot in my classes, as I said, and the way I usually describe this is, the top of it, the stem end, is North Pole. The bottom end, that fuzzy root end, is the South Pole, okay? So it's sitting like this, North Pole, South Pole. I don't wanna cut this on the equator. I always wanna cut this from North Pole to South Pole or vice versa, never on the equator, okay? We're gonna show you why that is. But our first cut when we're cutting an onion tends to be just cutting off the fuzzy part of the root end for this cut, okay? By the way, this cut that we're doing right now is just a basic chopped onion that you would use for starting a soup or tomato sauce or something like that, okay? So as I was saying, the first cut here is just taking off this root end. I'm just barely gonna take that off, but I'm gonna leave the root intact. Just a little nubby piece. I don't know if you can see it with the glare. Let's try up here, but there's a little root end in there. You can see it, okay? So next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take off the North Pole here, the stem end, and I'm just gonna kick those into my stock pot. And now my onion can just kind of lay flat, okay? It's not gonna roll around. Now I see the stem end, I've got stem end up, the South Pole, and I'm gonna cut directly through that from South Pole to North Pole, okay? And then once I do that, I can grab the edge of this peel and pull it off, okay? I'm just gonna use a paring knife because I don't have a fingernail. Boop, come on, come on. He's not coming off. I had to do a little surgery there, that was some funk. Sorry, folks. That was a funky little onion. Du, 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 du. Funky little onion. All right. Let's get rid of all of this peel. I don't want to drag onion peel into my prep. Always working clean, always wiping it down. Hey, Dennis McIntyre, good to see you there, brother. And Roberta. Cheers, everybody. I need a little sip here, guys. Whew. It's a hot time in the old town tonight, I'll tell you. Okay, going back to our onion. I've got a root end here that's gonna kind of hold the onion together. And there's another one right there. The other end is the stem end and that's the end that we're gonna be cutting. I don't want this woody root end here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to get the root end, I'm sorry, the stem end, the side we're gonna cut, that's facing you guys, okay? That's facing you. And the stem end is facing me back over here, okay? I'm gonna pull that out to the edge of the board here where my hand can kind of work without running into the cutting board. You see what I'm doing there? I'm kind of off of the cutting board here over on the side. And I'm gonna do two horizontal cuts. My left hand is just perched tiny, tiny on the top of that thing. And I did one horizontal cut and another one. And I wanna point out, I did not go all the way through. Let's do another one of those just to show you. I'm about that far back, okay? And then I just kind of zip through. So it's still being held together back here. Now I'm gonna turn that face that was toward you guys. This is the stem end. I'm gonna turn it towards my right corner over here and I'm gonna go over the top. Chop, 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 I'll go faster, it's more fun, okay? Now, and by the way, I've got a paring knife right there. You don't want that stuff on your cutting board, right? Just one thing on your board at a time. Now, as I went through that, I was kind of doing kind of a fan-shaped cut, so you can just go straight across it too. Now I'm gonna turn the face of the onion towards everybody at home again, and I'm gonna cut across the face of that. We're gonna do this one more time. Um, once I get down to where it's really small and my claw can't hold on to it, I'm just gonna push it over, and then I'm gonna cut it some more, just trim up the sides, and then that little woody stem is going in my stock pot. Yay, all right? There's still some chunks in there. I'm gonna go through those in a second, okay? This is called a Cicele onion. I'm gonna show you another onion cut in a second. Let's do another Cicele. I'm back towards the edge of my board and I'm gonna do two horizontal cuts. My left hand is perched on top of the onion. My knife blade does not go all the way through. I'll do a third cut. I'm not going all the way through. It's all being held together in the back here. Now I'm gonna turn that onion away from you guys and towards the uh, far corner over in this direction here, my right shoulder basically. It's facing me and I'm going across the top and I'm keeping my knife blade straight up and down this time. Hey, it doesn't matter. 
Now I'm going to turn the face to you guys again. That's the stem end. And I'm going to cut across the top. And I want to steal my knife blade when I'm done with this. I'm ready to steal that guy. Um, before I steal, actually, I'm going to just go through this a couple of times. Once you're done, you've got these oddball pieces in there that don't quite fall apart. Just run your knife through the whole mess a couple of times. You see my claw hand on one side. You see my grip hand. I'm barely, here's my pinky sticking out. You don't need those other fingers. They're just waving around, right? You don't even need them. And that's a Cicelay onion. It's beautiful, okay? That's what you need for starting a soup or a stock or something like that, a sauce, anything like that, all right? Let me uh, scoop that up and we'll go to the next item. I think the next item I will do, let's see, I gotta do some garlic for you guys. Oh, I need to show you another onion cut. Very important, a julienne onion. Let me show you that. Hope you guys aren't going anywhere. I'm just keep, I'm just gonna keep running through some cuts here. Suzanne's out there. Cam is out there. Very excellent. I just saw Anita as well. Let's see. I'm gonna run through another onion here, just real quick, half of it. I wanna show you a, a julienne onion dynamics, okay? There's a thing here that bugs me about julienne onions, okay? So for this one, again, I'm gonna clean it the same way. I'm gonna take off the North Pole and the South Pole. I'm taking off the whole South Pole this time. Here she goes, okay? Here goes South America, <laughs> Antarctica, and here goes the North Pole, okay? I'm gonna kick those uh, uh, end pieces to the side. I'm gonna cut that uh, down the middle from North Pole to South. I'm gonna remove the peel and I don't need to clean the other half of this. I just wanna show you one of these. Boop, boop, doo. All right, so here is my onion. What I wanna show you is there's a grain to the onion. There are lines going from the North Pole to the South Pole. Think of them as magnetic fields, okay? But this is the line. You can see it better up here. See those lines? I wanna cut my juliennes with those lines. Let me show you what it looks like if I cut in the other direction. If I cut across the line, okay? When I cut across the line, I'll do two of them. When I lay out the pieces, I've got all these different sizes, right? That's not a very nice julienne. Look at this one all these different sizes. Plus it's a really extreme curve. It's not a gentle curve. It looks like a C, not just an arch or something, right? So we don't wanna cut across the grain with these things. Let me show you what another onion will look like, okay? Um, actually, I am gonna use this other thing. They're so little, they're so little. Put that onion back together. I can rebuild it. Let me get this back down here. My onion fell apart. I'm gonna peel this guy and this onion, I am gonna cut with the grain. Another thing to point out, you know, the center always grows a little weird. I take that piece out, okay? Whoops, I just dropped it. Because it just grows a little funky. When I take out the center of this onion, the rest of these pieces are gonna be perfect juliennes if I cut them with the grain. So I'm going with the lines on the onion this time. And when I do that, Check out a line of onions. They're all the same size and all the same shape. They all match, no matter what slice they come from, okay? So we go with the grain, pop out that centerpiece and you won't get any oddball shapes out of it and they'll all be perfect, perfect. I like that for my red onions on salads. I like red onion on salad, okay? So that's a beautiful little onion julienne there. So first we're gonna start with a bulb and we're gonna break that bulb down into cloves, okay? So I'm going down and I usually put the bulb upside down and press on the root and the whole thing just shatters. And I'm, it's got a ton of skin. I got this at a farmer's market around here, Sacramento grown, the real deal. And I think I'm just gonna, let me get about five cloves out here or so, maybe about six or eight, because I wanna show you three different garlic cuts. Okay. So as we're going through the garlic, my first garlic cut is to remove the woody stems on those garlic cloves, okay? So I'm just gonna go through that real quick. All of these guys, I got about six or eight pieces here, and I'm just gonna go zip, zip, zip. Oop, come on. I don't like to leave that woody stem in there. It will not cook down and somebody will bite into it. 
Once I go through all of these guys, I'm going to go through another step that goes in the stock pot, by the way, another the next step. Sorry, guys, I was off the board there. I'm going to go ahead and crack those cloves by putting the tip down next to the clove and then leaning the knife against it. And then I just give it a little smack tip down, kind of lean on it, smack it a little harder. There it goes and smacking it and another boom. And I'm going to peel that. Actually, I'm going to be nice to this garlic. Okay. So it's just falling out of its shells at this point. If it doesn't fall out of its shell, what I do is I roll it in my hands and the shell just fall right off. Another little piece. There's a layer in between. There they go. Roll it in your hand and the peel comes off. I got Susan out there. Excellent. Thanks for joining everybody. Quarantine kitchen happy hour. Don't forget to watch on Thursday, guys. If you didn't hear earlier, uh, Mr. Uh, Chef Bill No is going to be joining me from crew again. And uh, he had to shut down for COVID. He's going to tell me about the reopening and what they all had to go through. And I'm going to run that on a show on Thursday at five o'clock between two stoves interview with Bill No from crew, the triumphant return. So please check that out. All right. Almost done peeling garlic. And I think I'm about there. Oop. It's all coming off. One thing about this garlic, it's very sticky, okay? And so I got to rinse off my hands and really clean this place up. I've got clean garlic. And what you're going to see first is just some sliced garlic. You see this in like the movies and stuff. Uh, uh, you see it on Food Network. For slicing the garlic, I'm going to uh, steal up my blade again, okay? So here we go, holding it up, using the whole steel and the whole blade. Mm, you don't have to do it that fast. By the way, another trick with this, if you're nervous, is sometimes you can just stand, whoops, stand your steel up and go on both sides of it like so. So you can also try that method as well. I'm not so used to doing that. I have to be careful when I'm doing that one. All right, uh, let's see the first one. I'm just gonna do some sliced garlic. I got a little funky edge on that. And I'm just gonna make a tiny little claw. I'm gonna get in position with my hand. I just steeled up my blade. It's razor sharp and I'm just gonna go across the face of it. And that's how I do sliced garlic. And when it gets to the end, I just kind of push it over and go through it sideways. There's little pieces, okay? So a couple of little pieces of sliced garlic. I'll just go through this one too. By the way, I'm going across the grain of this. The, the garlic has fibers in it. So I'm kind of cutting across those fibers, kind of opening up those cell walls. And it just kind of tipped over and I'm still going through it. And that knife is just riding on those, those finger, uh, those knuckles, right? It's never gonna cut my fingertips as I roll through that stuff. I'm not gonna say never, but, but I think I did. Okay, so uh, the way that I learned originally how to clean garlic, I did it in class last week, is um, the first thing you do is smash the garlic. And then you can really see the fibers of the garlic, then you cut through it. And, uh, and then you smash it again. We do a lot of the garlic chopping with the side of our knife not the edge, not the cutty part. <laughs> and I go through it again. You saw how I kind of drew it all together. I did this in last week's class too. And then I'll smash it again. And then I want to show you one more cut here, another trick. So that's chopped garlic. And the third one I want to show you. So there's sliced, there's chopped. The third one I want to show you is just like the chopped but this one, I'm gonna add a little salt and this will puree my garlic. So, so as you're going through spinach or herb, you don't want any stem in there. So go ahead and pull that stuff out. You might wanna give this an additional rinse too. I know a lot of your lettuces and things like that are uh, clean already. So maybe give them a quick little rinse. This one, I'm just gonna cut and throw away and I'm gonna clean my board again. So I'm just gonna show you this cut. I'm not gonna use this spinach. All right, still a little wet here. Now, when you're doing the chiffonade, before I even touch the spinach here, uh, I'm going to steal my knife again. There are certain jobs I won't do without stealing my blade, and this is one of those jobs. Whenever I'm cutting herbs, I always, always steal my knife again. So here I go. Let me kind of get a different angle for that. 
I'll do it this way. There we go. I'll try and go slower. It's hard for me, guys. Okay. And so got a good steel on my blade. Okay. I'm just kind of wiping that off. Now with these leaves, I want to kind of lay them down on top of each other. Now spinach is kind of resilient. It doesn't bruise well, but uh, basil sure does. So if you're working with basil, you definitely want to kind of treat it like this. With spinach, I can kind of bunch it up and, and just kind of roll it. Okay. The next step is you roll it like a cigar, okay? And once you got it kind of rolled up gently, we're not smashing, because again, this could be basil and it bruises very easy, okay? Next thing we do, we go across the face of it, super, super fine, okay? I'm showing you a fine shipping knot here. I'm using a very tiny claw back there. And my hand, uh, um, my hand placement is exactly as it has been all this time. And we're just doing kind of a lacy little shipping on here. Very, very fun. I do this with uh, parsley a lot, like Italian parsley. It's very nice. Okay. And there she is. That's a little shipping on. And so we will lay that down on our board. I can only think of two more things I need to do. One of them is going to be messy, so I'll leave that to the end. The other one is called a tournée, and I just wanted to introduce this to you. This is what we used to teach um, uh, in culinary school to teach parry knife control. The tour de nay is a little seven-sided football shape. It's right here. You guys see that? Okay. There it is. 3D. Okay. Seven-sided football shape. Now, I never count the sides. I don't know who would, okay, unless you're in a culinary school. But the idea here is to teach parry knife control, right? Having students be able to work a parry knife against their thumb is, is kind of the motion when I'm using a parry knife. You don't use a parry knife like down on a, on a cutting board. It's just, no, it's this kind of motion. So we teach this tournée for so people can kind of get used to that uh, muscle movement, right? And build memory so they don't even have to look at it when they're doing this, okay? So the idea with this tournée is you're doing a turning cut here. So you don't want to use the heaviest part of your blade. You want to use the thinnest cut. This knife right here, look at how thin the tip of that knife is. I can do nice curving strokes with a thin little tip like that. So I tend to prefer a bird's beak for this job. It's actually kind of made for this. And what we'll do is kind of choke way up on this and just use the tip of this guy. And I will kind of hold on to the, the carrot or whatever it is I'm making. It could be a potato or whatever. Um, I can kind of hold on to it with my index finger and my thumb. Sometimes I'll use my middle finger and I go back and forth with those two. And what I will do is I'll start that turn choke up on the knife, just using the tip of it, and I'll just do one long smooth cut, boom. And you can see the curve to it, just very gentle curve, right? And I'll use my fingertips to kind of manipulate it to the next cut, and I'll go from top to bottom again. Now carrots are tough because they have these layers in them. So sometimes you'll cut into them, but there's my next cut, okay? You know, I'll tell me, tell you, if a student gave me one side like that, I was pretty happy. You know, it was usually like chip, 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 you know, they look like gemstones, right, instead of uh, nice smooth cuts. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of keep going through this, making my cuts. You'll notice as I do this, my hands turn away from each other, okay? This is called the tournée or turn to vegetable, okay? This is meant to take an a uninteresting root vegetable like a turnip and make it into something interesting back in the old days when they didn't have microgreens to fix everything. Nowadays, you just, you know, a plate doesn't look good. Heck, just throw microgreens on it. That's, that's a thing. That's a joke. Nobody gets me. Okay, I'm still going through this. And once I've gone around, now I've gone all the way around, but I want to kind of work on the accuracy, accuracy of this. Some of those cuts aren't looking so good, so I'll kind of shave a couple of them out. I just keep turning round and round until it's shaved down to this perfect little football shape. I'm just kind of lame. I don't really like the shape of a tournée. It's not something I would put on a plate ever, but I'll tell you what, if you can do a tournée, you've got paring knife control down. You can, you can use a paring knife at the end of that, right? And after a while, you can kind of do this backwards and stuff, uh, behind the back and all of that. Don't ask me to. I want to get my kitchen floor dirty. Okay, so I got a little tournée there, okay? The most dreaded cut in all of culinary school. The students hated that cut. Almost every student I've ever had told me that they were not built for that cut. Eventually you get it down. All right, finally, I want to clean up this bell pepper and then we're just going to do a big old recap of this thing. So um, my bell pepper, let me pull this guy. 
Now, he's pretty much collapsed on himself. He's very much softened, right? All of this black char is going to come right off, and uh, I'm just going to knock it into the sink here. I don't want to rinse this. If I rinse it, I lose the flavor of that char. Much better if I just do it by hand and not try and wash it. All right, it's almost done, super close. Now, when I'm cutting bell peppers, let's just pretend this is a raw bell pepper. Let me rinse off it. Ah, ah, sticking to me. Okay. Don't look over there, look over here. Okay, so when I'm cutting a bell pepper, I see so many people just lop off the top and the bottom. I was taught to cut a bell pepper or clean a bell pepper by going from top to bottom, opening it up and then cleaning out the seeds. That little bell there is what I call that. I get rid of all those seeds and all of it is usable meat. I don't understand the whole uh, uh, taking off the top and the bottom. If I want perfect juliennes, I can certainly get them out of the piece that I got laying right here. I will literally see people like throwing the tops and bottoms away. And that is food, especially a bell pepper. They cost a fortune. Clean up these seeds. One seed in the whole mix drives me crazy. All right. So there is clean bell pepper and I can just do whatever I want with that, okay? Cut it long ways. I don't really have a cut I wanna do with it. I uh, was just gonna kind of mix it in with my dinner later on tonight, just kind of pull it apart, you know, and just serve it, okay? But I wanted to show you how to clean the thing and, and get that beautiful usable bell pepper out of there. It's awesome. And it's got a taste that can't be beat. And so let's see, um, let's, let's go over an overview here, okay? I think I've covered all of the cuts I wanted to do. We talked about the knives and everything. So let's kind of take a look at it. We um, uh, talk about different types of knives. The first type of knife was a, a, um, a stamped knife. It was kind of an inexpensive blade pressed out of a sheet of steel, sharpened, slap a blade on it, and that's what you get. They're inexpensive. They're soft metal. They can get sharpened really, really easily, but they don't hold an edge, right? A forge knife was the other type. They're much thicker, heavier, right? Here's my dirty knife right here, right? But thicker, heavier. They've got that bolster in there, that big, heavy, chunky thing in the middle of the blade where the handle's attached, right? Um, these forge knives, much more expensive, harder, harder steel. They keep an edge much longer, but they're also kind of difficult to get an edge up if you let them get dull, okay? Um, let's see, once we went through those basic types, I went over a bunch of different chef knives. Remember, this is kind of the basic shape that you want, kind of a deep blade where your knuckles aren't going to be hitting the counter as you're working. I gotta kind of wipe my hands off here. Um, and uh, uh, you'll, you'll kind of be in business for those chef knives. I showed you some Japanese steel. The thing to note there is uh, sometimes they're only sharpened on one side. Uh, I showed, and they are usually a forged knife. They, you don't see many of the stamp knives for those. Um, let's see, we went over butcher knives again. I did that in a class a couple of weeks back as well. I showed you a bunch of different paring knives. I showed you the straight ones and also those little bird's beak ones, right? And I showed you some forged versions and I showed you some stamped versions of those, right? I showed you some old school uh, vintage carbon steel knives. I talked about how if we use those, uh, acidic foods tend to get tainted. The flavors will get tainted by using those knives. Uh, so we want to kind of avoid them for that. And they will also rust if you don't uh, dry them thoroughly. Okay. Um, let's see what other types of knives. We talked about scissors too, for heaven's sakes, right? Slicers as well and serrated blades. Um, I talked about how serrated knives can sometimes, you know, you can get an inexpensive one and just kind of throw it away when it gets dull or you can get uh, a really good one. It'll hold an edge longer, but eventually it's kind of hard to put an edge back on that thing uh, if it's a serrated knife, okay? Let's see, after we... Uh, Went through all of that. We talked about how to hold a knife, how to stand. We talked about the grip. We talked about the claw. Ah, remember to keep that elbow sticking way out to the side while you're doing your claw. You know, all of that. Ooh, I got bell pepper on me. But uh, uh, that claw going up against your knife, right? Elbow way out at the side there. And you are in business, right? Uh, that whole safety stance. And mostly the biggest thing while you're cut, doing those cuts is remember to breathe and stay pretty loose. You don't want to be all stiff with that stuff. I used to get so nervous on day one of like knife cuts in school. It was just very, very nerve wracking, I will say. Okay, let's see. Um, after we kind of looked at um, the different... Uh, uh, 
stances and the cuts, uh, the holds and all of that. We talked about safety and then we started going through knife cuts and we went through um, some, some of your basic straight cuts. Let me show you those again. We showed you the Julienne in the center there. I showed you a baton, that green line, the big green line there. And I also showed you the dices on the other end, that one right there, the small dice, and also the Brunoise, which was made out of that Julienne right there. And you can even go finer for both of those cuts too, okay? We showed you this the lozenges and the uh, paisans over here, these flat cuts. And we also showed you, I'm trying to find it, that um, tournée right there. I also showed you one of those guys. So we showed you a bunch of knife cuts. I showed you the chiffonade. Um, let's see. Uh, I also showed you how to julienne an onion perfectly, pop out the center and cut with the grain. I showed you how to sisole an onion or chop an onion. I showed you three different cuts of garlic sliced chopped and pureed, and then I just pureed it all together, basically. Here are the batons, batonets, sorry, batonets and the small dice. Here are the juliennes and the brunoise. Here are all my little lozenges and uh, lozenges. Ah, and my beautiful, beautiful chiffonade, okay? All my cuts. And let's not forget my beautiful bell pepper right there. And I think that was kind of the show, guys. Usually I do a, uh, a knife, I'm sorry, usually I do a chicken fabrication in this class, but um, I felt like it was long enough today. And also I've done chicken fabrication a couple of times in my videos. I have one where I uh, break down a chicken into different parts, like different breasts and legs and thighs, all into those different parts. I have another one where I do um, more of a cut for fried chicken or a stew. Uh, we call that a, traditionally an eight way, but I showed you a nine way version of that. And I did that when we uh, processed that rooster in a show a little while back at Amy Gravish's farm. And I made a Coco Vaughn out of that rooster. I did a nine way cut out of that. So there's a couple of uh, chicken breakdown videos if you're interested in that sort of thing. We covered a ton of stuff about knives and knife cuts today in about 90 minutes, man. That was a full class and I hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to look me up on Thursday for the Between Two Stoves. Uh, boy, a lot of people checked in today. What a show, what a show. Thanks so much, guys. It's making me feel great. Um, I think that's it. I don't think we had any questions with the show. Thanks again for stopping by, guys. The party is always in the kitchen, especially when we're hanging out with you guys. This is awesome stuff and we're going to be doing it again next week. Who knows what I'm going to be doing? Well, you know, we'll see what the week holds, okay? But uh, for now, you guys take a chill and uh, uh, have a good evening and stay safe all this week, okay? I hope we're all back and, and, and still feeling fine next week, okay? Take care, guys. I'm going to call it a night. Bye-bye.